It's Infrastructure Week in Rhode Island. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Welcome in. Infrastructure Week means what to you? I, I, I'm, I'm not sure you know how to react to that, although I do have a note on school infrastructure here today. The Providence Journal put some really ugly pictures in their newspaper this weekend that ought to remind us how embarrassed we ought to be about what investment we have not made in our schools. But there's all sorts of other infrastructure uh, that uh, is a constant conversation and you know how we fund it, how we get after it, uh, I think is an interesting uh, angle to our contemporary conversations and the CEO of the Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank is here this evening to talk to us about that. Pleasure to have you aboard. Welcome in on this May Monday evening. Uh, all bets are off. Headlines. The U.S. Supreme Court just before press time. We record this program each afternoon. Uh, reacted to that seems to be somewhat serendipitous. The Providence Journal put this headline in just before uh, well, we put this headline in for the show just before we started. Big push to open sports betting here in Rhode Island and it's an interesting conversation that goes along there to try to determine whether or not we've actually authorized sports betting here. I think legal minds on both sides could actually argue either side of the case. So I'm not going to stand in my head and say we haven't done the right thing yet, but I think it's worth examining. Meanwhile, the U.S. Supreme Court just now, today, decided that uh, New Jersey wins. New Jersey brought the lawsuit uh, that said, hey, look, you can't prohibit us. This is a federal regular, this is a federal prohibition on a state right. Uh, Nevada being the only place where you could have sports gambling on a, on a legal basis. And now there are five states, reportedly, that are poised with legislation not only already passed, but sports books already built, ready to go in the next two to three weeks. We are in a funky place here in Rhode Island because I believe the Raimondo administration and even the legislative leadership thinks that we have already passed enough of a law to allow for us to just make this transition to sports betting. Uh, we'll dig into that over the next uh, few days here and on the radio on WPRO weekdays 3 till 6 because I like to hear the arguments on both sides. It better be that way for the Raimondo administration. They already booked in $23 million worth of, worth of budgetable money in our current state budget plan for receipts from sports gambling. That's called a flyer, and uh, I'm not sure when this plane actually lifts off or lands. Uh, we shall see. Uh, minimally, minimally, with the way this joint run, runs, it's going to have to be three or four months uh, to get our acts together on that whole thing. So it's going to be interesting. And let alone the whole conversation about whether it's good versus, I guess that horse left the gate a while ago, right? I guess it's ironic to use horse as a metaphor, right? But the... Uh, since we love gambling on horses. Uh, interestingly enough, though, can I just mention this? New Jersey, pro in their current legislation, prohibits gambling on their local schools. So you can't bet Rutgers. If Rutgers is playing Seton Hall, can't bet them. Uh, the state schools. Now, why is that? I think that should give you pause. Just think about it. Something's wrong if you can't bet the local schools. There's so something possibly corrupt about this whole thing. And the NFL has already petitioned Congress today to say, hey, can you write a federal law on this whole thing? All right, let's move along. Uh, this uh, front page in the Providence Journal is really interesting. Uh, you know, every time we're reminded that it's not just the Providence City Schools that are crumbling, I think that's a good thing. The uh, Barrington Middle School is about to be rebuilt the tune of, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 million dollars. It is amazing how many schools out there are in desperate need of being rebuilt and, and we don't have the money. And Governor Raimondo has been playing around with this billion dollar idea to build new schools. We already have a half a billion dollars baked in the budget already and it's not near enough. 
for the new money that's been allocated, the city of East Providence is on the line, so to speak, for its high school and other schools and will gobble up most of the new money. The proposal for the balance of the half billion dollars of new money is not for another few years. And meanwhile, we're sitting here picking our noses trying to figure out how we're going to teach our kids when the ceilings are falling down. We got a big problem in the state. And by the way, it ain't brand new. When I moved in here in 1999 and rode my wife around the, the, the state, all she, the, her first reaction was, what a dump these schools are. That's almost 20 years ago now. It's on us. It's on us. Uh, Pedro, I should say Pedroia, Pedro. I just went back about 10 years, 15 years? Uh, I'm still upset about him hitting our coach. Anyway, that would be the Yankees. Uh, Pedroia is tuning up in Pawtucket. I think the legislature ought to take the bill up right now. They ought to take the bill up right now. The House ought to move the bill right now. If there's actually an interest in passing the, the stadium financing, you know, get it when we got a big time guy playing around at the ballpark. Because as I've been learning lately, uh, the incremental progress that Worcester is making on this project is significant. So while Speaker Mattiello is afraid of his own shadow in District 15, which won't care a rat's patooey about this come Election Day or beyond, and I promise you if they move to Worcester six months from then, the electorate will be saying things like, I can't believe you let the Paw Sox go. That is very, very close right now. And for some reason, the Speaker just can't seem uh, to put a proposal together that he thinks he can sell to his... Uh, friends in the legislature, so we'll see. I don't know how much rehab Pedroia is going to be doing in Pawtucket, but, you know, you can hurry. All right, here's the headline. Infrastructure Week kicks off. And don't worry, I don't know what it means either. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Deal is the CEO of the Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank, but I'm starting to understand what your fine organization does. Welcome to the broadcast. Good. Thank you very nice much. Nice to Jim. have you. Great to be here. What does the <clears throat> Infrastructure Bank do? Well, we invest uh, money in uh, by making loans to local municipalities and some of the quasi-state agencies in four sectors. We support drinking water and clean water, which for most people like myself is wastewater and sewage. Uh, we do clean energy projects for both public sector buildings and the, at the local municipal level and for small businesses We're working on a residential program. We lend money for to repair roads and bridges, and uh, we've got a new brownfield remediation fund that we're... Uh, set up. All right. So we'll dig into some of the specifics of that work um, in our next segment. What is this Infrastructure Week concept? Well, it's a celebration of infrastructure and the need for, in, uh, for improved and repaired infrastructure. It was really set up by an or, a nonprofit called InfrastructureWeek.org. And it was uh, funded and supported by institutions like the AFL-CIO, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, National Association of Manufacturers, and the Brookings Institute, to name a few, and a number of others. And we've joined as uh, one of 300 affiliate members, uh, and we're holding a series of uh, uh, events around the state to have a dialogue around infrastructure, understand what infrastructure is needed and, and uh, what some of the barriers are. But we're also celebrating some of the projects that we've been involved in, both large projects like uh, 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 revamping and, and upgrading of the Warren wastewater treatment facility, harden it against uh, climate change uh, and increase the capacity, but also some individual projects. We lend money to homeowners to remediate cesspools and septic systems. And so we make little loans to homeowners as well. Do most people know that? Uh, not enough people know about it. And that's one of the things that when I came into this job a couple years ago, uh, we really turned the organization from a program-centric uh, institution to customer centric and so we've been out uh, uh, meeting with local cities and towns we've created marketing campaigns around our programs uh, thank you very much for having me on today because this is part about how we get the word out of what we're trying to do hmm. all right we'll get into some of the things that they're doing specifically when we come back Steve. So we have a link at foxprovidence.com for you uh, after the program on uh, Infrastructure Week to that, to that particular website from the Infrastructure Bank. If we could put up um, a full screen here on some of the initiatives that the Infrastructure Bank 
in Rhode Island is doing, fund improvements to local roads and bridges, preserve and clean water supply, support Rhode Island businesses, help lower energy costs. There's also some consumer stuff, as um, uh, Jeff Deal mentioned, that we should we should talk about. Explain again for me what the role of the infrastructure bank is in the cause in the in the diagram of, of state government. The infrastructure mm -hmm. bank is a quasi government That's agency, right. correct? And That's when we correct. say quasi, it's a private organization mostly funded by public dollars. Uh, yeah, I mean the, the the governor appoints our board and the general treasurer is also on our board. Uh, we get limited amounts of capital mostly in their water programs from the federal government. Uh, the state has to match 20 percent and then we borrow uh, four dollars uh, in the private bond markets for every dollar of federal funds we get. So we leverage what we get in capital. You regulated at that ratio four to one? Is that No, that's really more a function of uh, 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 we, re we issue bonds as a AAA, which is the highest credit rating out there, uh, because of the level of capital that we have and the coverage that we have on our bonds. How much, how much principal dough do you have sitting in the infrastructure bank? Well, we've, we have a balance sheet that is about $1.6, $1.7 billion, uh, and that's mostly loans in our clean water and drinking water. That's a huge amount of money. That's, that's, that's not in, see, I always get confused by this, and we've had some, some fun discussions about what this organization ought to be titled. The, 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 it's not a traditional bank. People don't make that's correct. deposits, um, but they can borrow money from the organization. Uh, municipalities can. I mean, as somebody told me earlier, maybe we should have called it the paving and loan. The what? The paving and loan. So, you know, we do roads, roads and bridges. The savings and loan. <laughs> da -da -ding -ding. That's a Jersey guy humor, sort of. Um, but again, you know, what we're doing is we're investing uh, in, in, we're providing finance to local cities and towns to invest in their infrastructure. So where, where does the consumer part of that come in? Well, we have a couple of programs that, that help uh, remediate cesspools and uh, septic systems. Is that and direct funding to the homeowner? We provide loans to the homeowners, yes. We work with Rhode Island Housing who administers okay, well, that's that that's what I was asking. Yeah. Was just, so, so while someone isn't going to be taking, putting cash in or taking cash out of the infrastructure bank in Rhode Island, both communities and individuals can access funding from it. Yeah, the, the, the homeowners need to be in a community that participates in our program. Gotcha. Uh, so you have to work through your community, yes. through the municipality. Yes, and the municipality sets the, uh, the, the criteria under which the loans are made. Uh, and we work with Rhode Island Housing, who administers it. That's what they do. And we do small loans, and so they do the credit work and the the uh, servicing and we provide the capital to that. Having 1.6 or 7 billion dollars out there is no small potatoes. It's a significant amount of money. I mean, think about it, the state budget on an annual basis is about 9 billion dollars. So, um, that's... Yeah. I mean, we've that, never, we've, ne we've never had a, uh, a default on any of our loans, nor have we had any delinquencies. Well, when you lend to towns, yeah. It's a pretty safe bet that we they're like going to sometime, so. uh, uh, you know, pay down. I guess uh, if a community went under, went belly up, that would put some financing in trouble. Correct? Uh, well, we we have a direct line from our loans to the investors, so the bond investors are effectively investing through us into those loans. So if there is a default, we have mechanisms on how some of the loans will change in their parameters, but the bondholders are really on the hook. But we also have capital in there that provides them with some safety as well. What, what are you, who's setting the priorities here? Well, we work with specific departments within the government. Uh, so for example, on our clean water, we work with the Department of Environmental Management. And for a project to be eligible for, for our financing, they make a, a, an application to DEM. And DEM has a, a, a transparent scoring system that then puts it on a project priority list. So they grade every project. So it doesn't matter where the project is or who's sponsoring it. If you are rank higher on that project priority list and they make an application to us, if we have a limited amount of capital that year, we lend to the number one priority, then the two, three, four. And if you're lower down the, the list and we don't have enough money to go around, then you don't get financed that year. Who are you, who are you shopping your capability to? I mean, I, I, well, get, I get where you've already ex explained where the relationships are, but what, what, what's your inertia? 
Well, we're, what we've what's been doing the catalyst yeah. to your, to your what stuff? What we've been doing is we've been going out and meeting with the uh, local cities and towns, and 39 cities and towns across the state, uh, and trying to get a better understanding is what are their infrastructure investment needs? What are they near term? What are they medium term? And what are they long term? From an intersection in the middle of town that needs to be redone to the sewer ain't working very well. That's right. To what? Well, we look at energy as well. I mean, one of the th we have a new program called the, Ener the Efficient Building Fund, and that lends money to cities and towns to do energy efficiency and renewable uh, projects, put solar panels on the roof of a, uh, a building or put in a new HVAC system in a school or in a uh, uh, repair uh, garage facility. And uh, those projects actually pay for themselves. The amount of money that they save in maintenance and energy pays for the loan itself. And so a lot of what we're doing is trying to understand what infrastructure needs are in the local town so that we can help bring our different programs together. Do you, do you, do you spend any time thinking and talking about this dilapidated school building matter that we've got out there? Absolutely. I mean, I've been coming at the top of the show. Uh, we need a new idea. Yeah. I mean, our, our, our area within schools is around the energy and HVAC systems, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, you know, because that not only uh, can save money from an energy perspective, but it also provides a much better ambient temperature for learning. The new uh, why fans. Are just, why are you focused on HVAC specifically? Because that's part of the... Because that's part of where our program the, and our the, capital can go. And the, by guideline? Yes. Hmm. So we can do energy related things you know if you're going to uh, if you're going to put uh, solar on a roof we can rep help we can finance the roof repair to make sure it supports it uh, we also can do water conservation uh, also green infrastructure stormwater management in the parking lot uh, that helps if you're going to put in a new parking lot it makes sense to, from an environmental point of view to manage some of that runoff uh, it reduces the cost at the local wastewater treatment facility and reduces pollution in the river. Uh, and we can provide below market finance for those projects. All right, we'll talk about how, what the, uh, the local uh, orientation is to the infrastructure bank. How smart are our local officials in tapping into this resource? We'll be right back. So there's a thing happening in Providence. What happened uh, by the time you see the show at 7.30 at midnight uh, already happened today. How does this story tie in? Well, you know, we've been, uh, I, I grew up outside of Detroit. And so, uh, you know, I've watched the situation in Flint unfold with a lot of personal interest because I grew up not too far from there. And one of the things that we've looked at is the risks of lead pipes uh, in drinking water here in the state. And we had a summer intern that we hired last year, and we put her to one of the few interns that we hired, and we put her to work to make a study of lead pipe issues here in the state. And, and certainly, uh, it was she did a lot of meetings with Providence Water, and there's an issue of, of not you know lead pipes from the curb to the home uh, that's owned by the homeowner. Uh, but we now have the ability out of our EPA-based water programs to finance that remediation. And so we work with Providence Water to fund a loan program that they've set up. So we're going to provide a million dollars interest free for them to make loans to their customers it's to help defer the cost of replacing those lead pipes from the curb from the Providence Water System. Hmm. What are the terms the of those uh, loans? Uh, interest free for three years. Wow. So, uh, and, you know, so it's a, a pilot on program. The amount of money you can borrow? Uh, there, it's really typically the cost is around three to six thousand dollars to do this. Uh, you know, it depends on the difficulty of the project, but uh, each loan will accommodate uh, that I'll amount. a lot of plumbing work out there. That's a good thing. So we're uh, we're we're really excited about the program, and if it takes off like we think we will, we'll have more more money to put Does behind it. Does it possible um, sale? Involve you guys at all? I mean, is that uh, well? It's the politics of selling the water supply. Yeah, I mean, you know, Providence Water is one of our better customers. We we've uh, worked with them as a partner to finance a lot of the improvements in their system. Uh, so we're watching that with uh, interest. But but again, our loans are secured by the revenues that, that they have charging their customers. So you know, we're uh, watching it with interest. But again, so some we'll, entity we'll will be facilitating. Um, yeah, ultimately, the customer work anyway. ultimately, as long as people are buying water from them. We'll get paid. So this this notion that um, you know updating sewer and water and all that kind of a thing is is 
are, are you trying to market ideas? For, you're trying to create thinking amongst municipal and state leadership on these matters? Yep. Are most of the municipal uh, administrations well aware now of what opportunities exist at the State Infrastructure Bank? We're, st we're still getting there. Uh, I think we've come a long way in the last couple of years that we've started to be more proactive in marketing it. We're also trying to figure out, you know, we look at infrastructure really as a basic economic development tool, not as a basic service. And we really think that that's an important way to look at it. And we're looking how can we combine our programs, how can we uh, combine our programs with others. So we work with Commerce on their renewable energy grants. Uh, so we're making loans to uh, uh, facilitating loans to small businesses so that they can do solar or energy efficiency projects and take advantage of uh, incentives that are out there and save more money and make themselves more competitive. The other thing as well is in the efficient building fund, again, where we're lending to municipalities for energy efficiency and, and renewable energy, we've hired a consulting engineer at our expense because we recognize that in a lot of these spaces there isn't the uh, expertise. technical expertise. Mm -hmm. So we've hired this engineer and we offer them free of charge to municipalities and some of the quasi-state agencies. Just to go in and sit and take a look at the, what the town's Ex status exactly. is. Exactly. And so you have, you have a uh, agenda-free uh, consultant that's sitting on your t side of the table that's not trying to sell you something. And they help the, the municipalities look at their stock of buildings and facilities, recreation facilities, others. Uh, where should they prioritize energy investments? They work with the engineering firms well, and national grid. He's got that grid. to offer. It seems to me, 39 communities out there, I don't know how many governing bodies that really means, but it seems to me that if that's available, everyone ought to just get online and just have the guys stop by, <laughs> right? Uh, well, seriously, just uh, take a look and say, hey, give us an update. We've been successful in getting most communities to take advantage of that program, it, and we'll continue to do that. Are you feeling like, again, across the board, the municipal level of government is you know, on a scale of zero to 10, 10 being, you know, most aware, how aware across the board are local communities about what the opportunities are with you? I think we're, we're you know, certainly, we're not where we want to be, but we're higher than, you know, we're, we're probably in the seven or eight range. Why are you not where you want to be? What does that mean? Well, a lot of it is just because we've just really started this initiative in the last couple of years of getting out and, and marketing our programs. A good example is we, are, we met with a water company uh, who we do a lot of drinking water loans with. Uh, they have a couple of dams that they need to deal with. They did not think that our clean water program would be available to them. This clean water program can, can help them with dams. Mm. They've always just borrowed from the drinking water program. And so now we're having a dialogue of, okay, we've got cheap finance for you to, to help remediate some of these dams. And they'd lowered, they'd lowered the priority of those dams because they didn't know how they were gonna finance it. Gotcha. They just didn't think that we had other programs that might be available to them, right, even so, though they're a very good customer. So as an everyday person watching, uh, like, you, like you and me, just you know, let your local officials know that they ought to be talking to the infrastructure bank if they're not doing so already. In this infrastructure week, appreciate the visit. Thanks. Thank you very much. All right, the final word and we come back, stay with us. Tomorrow, we will have an interesting debate between the insurance industry and the auto body industry here in Rhode Island over aftermarket parts. The new bill is to stretch from 30 months to 48 months, the restrictions on insurance companies mandating that you use aftermarket parts. There's a whole big to-do going on between both entities. And I'm looking forward to the voices on the show tomorrow night. In the meantime, we'll check you out at 3 o'clock on WPRO, I hope. Thanks for watching. Bye.